Are you guys ready to get into it? Yes. All right, to do that, you're going to need a Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, raise your hand. I'd like to get a Bible to you. And if you don't own a Bible and need one, you keep the Bible that we give to you. It's our gift to you. If you know someone you need to give a Bible to, raise your hand, get a Bible, and give it to them. When you get that Bible, I'm going to ask you to open it to the book of 1 Corinthians, even though I'm not going to the book of 1 Corinthians first. How's that? All right, listen, last week we started a message called Learning My Spirit, uh, and we called it 1.0, and we're calling today 2.0, because I'm going to continue on this theme of learning my spirit, understanding the spirit of man, how it interacts with the Holy Spirit, uh, how it comes to life in the rebirth. So what we did last week, I'm going to catch everybody up for a few minutes here. What we did last week is we went to the book of 1 Thessalonians 5.23 and we read this. Now may God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we discussed was that we have a trinity in us because we're made in God's image, and that is that we have a soul, we have a spirit, and we have a body to catch you up if you weren't here last week. We know that everything that is not spirit and not body falls under the soul. So the mind, the will, the emotion, the personality, all of those kind of things are in the soul. And then we know what our physical body is. And now we're learning about what our spirit is. Uh, we know that there's a difference between the soul and the spirit because Hebrews 4.12 says that the word is like a two-edged sword that can split the spirit and the soul. So we know there are two different pieces there. And so we look back at Adam. When Adam was in the garden, God created him out of the dust of the earth, which would be the body. He breathed the spirit of life in him, which was the spirit. And scripture said Adam became a living soul. So there we have the three parts from the very beginning. And God told him not to sin, not to eat from this tree, not to disrespect, not to disobey, not to dishonor God by following the will of Satan. And yet Adam and Eve did that. And he said, if you do that, you will surely die. And yet we know that he sent them out of the garden. We know that they had more children. We know that they lived their life, that they were married, that they loved. So we know that the physical body did not die. And we know that his soul did not die. His thinking processes, his mind, will, and emotions didn't die. But his spirit died. His spirit died died. There was a spiritual disconnect between God and man. And so we understand then when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and he said, what must I do? And Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, how can I go back into my mother's womb? That doesn't make any sense. And he said, no, there's another birth that you have to go through. You've been born once, but you have to be born again. There's another birth. See, your body is alive and your soul is alive, but your spirit is dead. And so that must be birth. It must come to life. The spirit of man has to come to life. So he said it to him this way. Unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Now I want to give you one little nuance in there as I was reading through studying for this week again. Most of us look at that scripture and say, unless you're born again, you can't get into the kingdom of God. But what did he say? He said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. So there's a sight that we're going to have to be able to see the kingdom of God when we're born again. Nicodemus says, how can I? How can I enter a second time in the womb? I'm in John 3. Jesus answered, truly, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. So we know that our spirit is dead from Adam. How do we know that? Because 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So in Adam, through sin being brought into the world, all of us died in the spirit because of sin, and yet Christ made us alive again. This is going to make more sense if you weren't here with us last week. Just bear with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says it this way. So also is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, and the last man, Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. 
became a life-giving. We learned that it was a poyoe in the Greek, and it means to bring back to life, to restore to life. Christ has the ability to restore back to life your spirit, you. So I want to show you in a very, very popular place. I said Corinthians. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Let me show this to you because I think you've read this many times, and I'm hoping today it has a little bit of a new meaning for you. Ephesians chapter 2. I referenced this last week, but I didn't go into it, and I should have. So we're talking about the fact that through sin, man doesn't die, man's spirit dies. And Christ comes to pay the price to bring our spirit back to life, and we have to be born again. Our spirit has to be born again. Now watch this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. If you got it, say, I got it. If you don't, say, wait. All right, here we go. Now, remember the context of what we just discussed as we read. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that is a description of Satan, of the spirit that is now moving in the sons of disobedience. He's talking about that demonic spirit in this world. Among them, watch, we too all formally lived. Now, now this is Paul saying, I too lived under the prince of the power of the air. My spirit was dead. We all formally lived there. We lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of our mind. You see the soul and the body there? The flesh and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Four. But God, okay, here's where everything changes. Here's where the story flips over. But God, being rich in his mercy, his desire not to punish, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he's saying that God, who was rich in mercy, did not want you to be punished, loved you so much, even when your spirit was dead, even when you were in your trespasses and sin, he loved us, made us alive together with Christ. Now, just go back so I can make my point and see Paul is talking to a group of people. And he's saying, you were dead. Last week, you were dead. But now, you're alive in Christ. What is he saying? He's not saying they're physically dead. He's not saying they couldn't think. They had no personality, no mind, no soul. He's saying your spirit was dead. But now it's been made alive in Christ. By grace, you've been saved by faith. And he raised us up and he seated us with him in heavenly places. That's in the spirit. In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show his surpassing uh, riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. By grace, you've been saved through faith, and that faith, and that is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not a result of your work so that any man could boast. So what did we say last week? That between my soul and my body, there is a bridge to my alive spirit called faith. When I put my faith in Christ, in Christ is the phrase we'll hear over and over, meaning that my spirit has been born again. I now have faith that brings my spirit to life because my faith is believing in what Christ has done on the cross to redeem me and to bring my spirit back to life. So by faith, I've been saved. And that, this was a struggle for a lot of people. And if you're a real theologian, you and I can do battle with this. And that faith... That not of yourselves. For so long we talked about, oh, you've been saved by grace through faith, and what's not of yourselves is that you didn't work it. But I believe what this scripture is saying, that even faith is not of yourself. I don't have the capacity to have faith in what Jesus did for me unless God gives me the capacity called faith to put in Jesus. So it was a gift he gave me that enabled me to believe in Jesus. I, listen, the best way you can learn this kind of theology and understand what's going on here is stop taking credit for anything. Yes. <laughs> he made you. We messed it up. He made the path back to us and said, all you got to do is use what I gave you to get back to me. Amen. Whew, what a loving, amazing God. So I made the comment last week that I need to follow up that you, me, all of us included, have never seen our own face. You've never seen your face. 
Why? Because your eyes aren't in a position to see your own face. You've only seen a reflection of your face. You've seen it in a mirror. You see in a mirror and you say, that's me, that's what I look like, I recognize me. And we talked about the soul is like that too. None of us have seen the emotion anger. We've not seen sadness. We've not seen any emotion. But the reflection is what the body does in response to that. So we see the reflection of anger by looking at someone and seeing their face is red and their voice is louder and they're starting to perspire. There's anger there. We see the reflection. In the same way, I said, that the spirit looks in the reflection of the Word of God. The Word of God is the reflection for my spirit in the same way the mirror is for my body. And you're thinking, okay, where do you get that? I'll show you. James. Let's go to the book of James. I'm going to go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 19. You got it? Say, I got it. Got it. You don't? Say, wait. James 1, 19. For this, know, uh, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains in wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul because it brings your spirit to life. But prove yourself doers of the word and not mainly hearers who delude themselves. Now I want you to watch this because if you miss it, you'll miss why the word of God is the reflection of your soul, of your spirit. 23. If anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his what face? Who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. This is what he's saying. If you look in a natural mirror, you will see what kind of person you are. But when you walk away, it begins to fade and you wonder, did I really look that old? Am I really that gray? Do I really have that many wrinkles? No, I think I weigh less than the mirror showed me that I weigh. <laughs> so when we look at a natural man in a mirror, we see our natural man. Now watch this. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. What's he talking about there? The Greek word for the law there is nemos, nemos, and it means anything received or established. So we're talking about the word received or established by God. And I am saying that we're talking about both the Logos word, the documented written word that we call the Bible, and the Rhema word, those prophetic words that comes over you, those words that God speaks to you and tell you about you. He says, anyone who looks intently at what God said, at what you're receiving from God. He's not talking about the law of Modus. You'll notice it's a, a small L, not a cap L. He's saying that this law is the law about what it is like in God's house. When, when you come to my house, my kids live under Todd's law. Some of the things I've written down, some of the things I've told them. And that's what he's saying, that when you're with God, there is a law of liberty, the things that you have received from God. So he says, but you look at a mirror and see your natural self, okay. But you look intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, what God is saying that you're receiving, and abides by it, having become forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. What did he just say? He said, when you look in a mirror, you trust it. How do I know? If your hair is out of place when you look in the mirror, what do you do? I fix it. If I look in the mirror and my button on my shirt is undone, what do I do? I button it. What would happen if I looked at the Word of God and responded to the reflection the same way? What would happen if the Word of God said, Gideon, you are a mighty warrior? 
Would I hide in the wine press and say, no, not me, I'm the littlest of all? And then he finds out the word of God was true. He's a mighty warrior. So I look in this reflection called the liberty, the word, the law of God, and I find out who I am. So here's what I'm saying. You want to know what your body looks like? Look in the mirror. You want to know what your soul looks like? Have some emotions. You want to know what your spirit looks like? Look at the Word of God. Look at the Word of God. That's what your spirit looks like. That's why we talked last week about your spirit doesn't sin. Your spirit is God's spirit breathed into you. It was made dead by sin, but once it's brought to life, it doesn't sin. It is your holy of holies in the temple, it says in 1 Corinthians, that do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that spirit that dwells in you is your holy of holies. Now, I want to show you because if we're going to say, all right, I have come to Christ and I have an alive spirit and I can look at the word of God to know what my spirit looks like. Now, how do I act on that? How does that affect me? How does I walk through my life? Man, you're about to go into Bible dissection here. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians now, chapter 2. I'm going to show you how this process works for you. How do you understand my spirit is alive and it is in connection with God. It is in connection with the Holy Spirit and therefore it can begin driving my soul and my body. Whew. First Corinthians chapter 2. You got it? You got it? All right. You don't? Say wait. Here we go. This is deep. I'm in verse 9. I'm going to go do the whole chapter but I'm going to start in 9. The things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard. What are we talking about? Somebody say the body. He's talking about your eyes. He's talking about your physical eyes. You haven't seen this. He's talking about your ears. You haven't heard this. The things that you haven't seen or heard and which have not entered the heart of man. Now, heart is one of those descriptive words. We know in the Psalms that the heart is deceptively wicked. We know it's not part of the spirit. It's part of the soul. And so what he's saying here is, I've talked to you about what you can physically see in here, and now I'm mentioning the stuff that hasn't even gotten into your soul, and all that God, all that God has prepared for those who love them. Watch, 10. For God has revealed them. What? What is them? Things. It's the things from above. The things your eye haven't seen. The things that haven't entered your heart. For God has revealed those things, them, through the Spirit, capital S. Now we're talking about the Holy Spirit. He has revealed things through the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So this is what we know about the Holy Spirit. He knows what God knows. The Holy Spirit knows what God knows. He searches the deep things of God. You're going to see so that they can be revealed to us. Verse 11. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? You notice that spirit's a small s now. I hope so. Yeah. Sometimes translations. Now, now let me ask you a question. Why did we just change subjects? Why did we just go from what you haven't seen, what you haven't heard, what hasn't entered your heart, the Spirit of God knows because he searches the deep things of God. Why did we all of a sudden start talking about the thoughts of a man? Because he says, listen, who knows your thoughts except the Spirit which is in you? So now we have an alive spirit that's interacting with your mind. We have this alive spirit and mind and soul together. That's a confirmation that you have a spirit in you that's in alive and it knows your thoughts. Keep going. Even so, just like that, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. Now wait, what did he just do? He just said, you have thoughts and you have a spirit. God has thoughts and God has a spirit. And no one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit. And no one knows your thoughts except for your Spirit. We've established we have God and the Spirit. Whew. Okay, 12. Now we have received, you and I, not the Spirit of the world, small s. We haven't gotten into the prince of the power of the air because we've been made alive in Christ. But the Spirit who is from God. 
We have received, we've opened the door to Holy Spirit now that we have an alive spirit so that we may know freely the things given to us by God. Now, here's the key. You got to follow with me. You have a spirit. It knows your soul. God has Holy Spirit. It knows him. Holy Spirit's job is to search the deep things and show us what we freely receive from God. The Holy Spirit's job is to communicate to us what God has for us so that, and stay with me, so that we can know the thoughts of God. Amen. That's the Holy Spirit. He knows the thoughts of God. He searches the things. Now we've received the Spirit who is from God so that we may know the things that the eye hasn't seen, that the ear hasn't heard, which have not entered our soul. There are things that God is thinking that are for you to receive, but you can't do it through your eyes, your ears, and your soul. Whew, come on. Now look at 13. Which things, what? The things of God revealed to us by Holy Spirit. Which things we also speak. I am going to be able to speak the spiritual things of God because Holy Spirit brings them from God to my spirit so I can know what God has freely given to me. Amen. Keep going, 13. I'm going to get those things from Holy Spirit, not in words taught by human wisdom. That's a big ticket here. It's not human wisdom that understands the deep things of God. Do I get things from God and do I learn doctrine and theology from reading the Bible and connecting the dots? Yes. But there are things that are deep things of God that Holy Spirit knows that he wants you to receive. So he brings them to your spirit so you can receive them because you can't receive them in your soul because then you begin thinking and processing. And he's saying, no, it doesn't come by human thought. It comes by the spirit. Stay with me but in those taught by the Spirit. So we can speak God's thoughts that are taught to us by the Holy Spirit to our spirit, but we cannot grab them in our soul and our mind. Now watch, because this next verse is probably the most, or next section of the verse, it's probably been always confusing for you, but I hope to clarify it. So now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, but we don't speak them in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. And here's what happens. We combine spiritual thoughts. What thoughts are we talking about? The spiritual thoughts of the Holy Spirit, which come from God, and our spiritual thoughts get combined, get combined with spiritual words. Now, I can easily make an argument here that what we're talking about is speaking in tongues, prayer language, speaking in tongues. But I also want to make the point that what we're talking about is there's a spiritual connection between the things given to us in the spirit and the words that we're going to speak. Those things just got brought together when Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God, brings them to the spirit of man, and then he can be begin to under, understand spiritual things, provided he doesn't try to process it with his soul and his mind, but he processes it with his spirit. Now, this is deep. This is hard to grab a hold of. It's one of the biggest challenges, I think, in the walk of a minister, because as I train up ministers, most all of them want to use their mind. They want to process and say, this is what I'm doing. And I'm saying, listen to the Spirit. The Spirit will tell you what to do. Your Spirit will be directed by Holy Spirit to tell your soul and mind what to do. Let's keep going. 14, but a natural man, body and soul, that's my natural man. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. You know why? They think they're crazy. You Christians are crazy. You have a tumor and you say you're healed. This doesn't make any sense. How can you sit here and tell me you're healed in the name of Jesus and there's a tumor in your body? Ask that man right there how. Because the Spirit said these tumors aren't going to be there. 
but the natural man doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. Now, I want to I draw a line here and explain something. I think the natural man is the man whose spirit is not alive. Now he's just processing with the soul in his body because he doesn't have his spirit. So his eye sees a tumor. He knows what that means in the long run. He's seen it happen in the past to other people. And he begins processing with his natural man. But they're foolishness to him because he can't understand them. Why? Because they're spiritually appraised. They're spiritually appraised. So if your spirit isn't connecting with Holy Spirit, you don't get the spiritual words from God and there's no combining of God's thoughts with your words. They have to come through your alive spirit. I'm letting you process. Listen to me, this is going to change your Christian walk. And it's going to change, and I'm going to show you in just a minute. It's going to change your reading of Scripture when you understand the spirit that's alive in you. Let's finish this up. But he who is spiritual, my spirit is alive in Christ. He who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. What is he saying there? He's saying that the natural man cannot appraise the spiritual communication that's going on in a spiritual man. But the spiritual man cannot be appraised by that natural man because the natural man thinks he's a fool. But the spiritual man can say, your spirit isn't alive, so you're not going to understand this. So I have to present the gospel in a way that you can process with your soul and mind in order to open your spirit up to faith. Mm, that was a deep statement. 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord, the spiritual thoughts of the God, that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Those who have the spirit of man alive in them can communicate with Holy Spirit and know spiritual things. You guys are good because you're hanging in there. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to read you the front half of that chapter because I've just explained to you what he's saying. He's saying there are thoughts in you that only your spirit knows and there are thoughts in God that only the Holy Spirit knows. You don't know them in your eyes. You don't know them in your ears. You don't know them with your thoughts in your heart. But when Holy Spirit communicates with God, he can show you what you're supposed to receive from God in your alive spirit so your soul and body can follow. Amen. Got it? Amen. Now, let me prove to you that's what he's talking about. If I go back to the beginning of the chapter, Paul says this, when I came to you, brethren, I didn't come with superiority of speech or wisdom. I came proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, what puts me in Christ. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. I didn't want to appeal to your soul but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Now look at six. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. What's he talking about? Those whose spirit is reborn. Watch this. Yet we do not speak wisdom among those whose spirit is reborn. It's a wisdom, however, that's not of this age or of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom. Remember we said the Holy Spirit goes after the deep things of God and brings them to you and we can speak them? That's what he said. It's in a mystery. It's in a hidden wisdom that God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. All of these dead spirit natural people on this earth, they haven't understood spiritually what's going on. You know what they thought? They thought when they killed him on a cross, it was done. Why? Because they're appraising it in their natural man. They didn't appraise it in the spirit. They didn't say something just happened here. Something just happened. My spirit is telling me that we're in a new day, that that wasn't just a normal death. Why did the temple split in two? Why did the sky turn dark? Why was there trembling all around? Something happened. Why? Because I'm spiritually appraised it instead of appraising it in the physical, in my soul. If they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, Jesus explains his concept in, in John 6, 63, when he says, it is the spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing because the words that I'm speaking to you are spirit and life. Do you see what he's saying? 
I'm talking to you on the spiritual plane. I'm talking to your spirit man. I'm talking to that alive spirit in you that's connecting with the spiritual things. <clears throat> now, I want to I do a little test. You trust the mirror in your home. And when the mirror in your home tells you of an eyelash on your cheek, you take the eyelash off your cheek. And so I want to know who my spirit is. I want to see the reflection of my spirit. And scripture tells me that the reflection of my spirit is the word of God. Because everything that God says is true. So if God says it about me, it's true. And I can believe it. And I can act on that reflection. So if scripture says, I am loved by God, how do I know that? Okay, this is what I want you to say. I saw it in the mirror. So if scripture says, I am loved by God, how do I know that? If it says, I am healed, how do I know that? If it says, I can prosper, how do I know that? If it says, I have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead in me, how do I know that? If it says, I am righteous in the eyes of God, how do I know that? If it says, I have power over depression, how do I know that? If it says that I have power over my sin, how do I know that? If it says I have power over the enemy, how do I know that? So what would you be like if you never looked in the mirror? A mess. I like that answer. I would never know. Listen. I would never know who I really am. I would only know what I look like and what my emotions are like. I would never know who I am because I find out who I am. James tells us by looking intently at what God has given you because God speaks in life and truth in the spirit. Now, we're going to do a little test here. I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes while I read a very, very familiar scripture. You're not due yet. That way you don't feel like you're in this forever. What I want to do is I want you to listen to this scripture that you've heard before. I'm going to be in the back half of Romans 7 and reading the first half of Romans 8. But I want you to spiritually appraise it. I want you to try to understand it, not with your logical thinking, but with what it says. Because what it says is true, but you're going to see in the scripture I'm reading, Paul separating his body and his soul from his spirit. And when that happens, I'm going to click my... I'm going to clap my hand. I'm going to clap my hand so you can see when he transitions from talking about my soul and my body over to my spirit. But I want you to appraise this thing spiritually. Let this soak in. See if there's not a new understanding. Are you ready? Close your eyes. I'm in Romans 7, 22. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in my inner man. But I see different law. I see a different law in the members of my body. They're waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my body. Wretched man that I am, who's going to set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law the, uh, of God, but on the other with the flesh with my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, for what the law of Moses could not do, weak as it was in the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but we walk according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, they set their minds on things of the spirit. 
For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile, hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh can't please God. However, you're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit of man is alive because of righteousness. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brethren, we're under no obligation not to the flesh, uh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you gotta die. But if the spirit, by the spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you're gonna live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery really leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, then we're joint heirs. We're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. Amen. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that the Spirit of God dwells with the Spirit of man and it puts off the things of the flesh. I'll go back and read you a scripture I read last week, Romans 6, 12. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And don't go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness so the sin may not matter master over if you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Ricky, could you come up here, please? Nick, could you come up here? Chris, why don't you come up here? I want to give you a little demonstration of this so you'll have a visual. I want you up here, up top, up top, up top. Chris, I want you in the middle, and I want you to put your arms out like you guys are about to lock arms. So I want you to link arms. Get in there, link arms, link arms. Okay, so now we're looking at the three parts of men. This is the spirit of man, because the spirit always wears plaid. <laughs> this is the soul of the man in the middle, and this is the body over here with Ricky. <laughs> okay. So I have the spirit of man, I have the soul of man, and I have the body of man. And this is what Paul was just talking about when we present our members to unrighteousness. It is when our soul wants to de-link with our spirit and join our body. And then these two are now separated from the spirit, and they begin to go into unrighteous things. But when the soul of a man decides it wants to link with the spirit, then it begins to hear the things of God brought to it by the Holy Spirit. Now, now here's how it effectively works in us. The Holy Spirit brings to our spirit. Our spirit transponds those over to our soul. Our soul then tells our body to obey what the spirit has said to do. Yes. Now I'm going to blow your mind. I want you to watch this because if you miss this, you've missed a great point for today, a great revelation. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, able to pierce, watch me, able to pierce the soul and the spirit. Why is it able to pierce the soul and the spirit? Because this is a reflection of your spirit. And what that scripture is saying is it can divide. The word can show you where you're separated. It can show you, soul, where you don't believe you have an alive spirit, where you don't believe you're complete in Christ, where you don't believe you're gonna be redeemed one day. It can show you the truth about your spirit where it says you are a righteous child of God. You are hearing from the Holy Spirit. You are in covenant with God. You are a child of God. This is why the word of God can split 
split the spirit and the soul because it tells the truth about who you are. And your soul needs to know the truth about who you are, that it needs to be looking this way. And your spirit already knows the truth about where you are. But if your soul won't know it, it doesn't trust the spirit. But when it looks in the word of God and it looks through this Bible, it says, I believe what's being told about me and I can walk in the spirit because my reflection tells me that that's what I am in the spirit so I can believe that. Got it? You got it. Thank you, man. Thank you. So what are we trying to accomplish in this message? Here's what we're trying to accomplish in this message. Stop walking in the flesh. It will wear you out. How long have you been debating what's true about God based on, watch me, based on what you see, hear, and think? How long? How long are you going to continue to say, well, I saw somebody that didn't get healed, so God doesn't heal. But the Bible says he heals, and people get healed but you're trying to figure it out with your brain instead of letting it over to God and saying, show me the wisdom of your ways, God. Show me why you would hold off on that for now. Show me why. Show me why that person didn't get healed. I'm going to trust you and believe you for whatever you tell me because you only tell me the truth. I'm going to begin listening with my spirit. Now listen, it's a hard, hard, moralistic life to try to live out a Christian life with your soul. Because you're constantly thinking, how do I be nice? How do I do right things? How do... Listen, the goal to walking out the Christian life is faith Amen. in the Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, what are you telling me to do even if it doesn't make sense? I left a position making over $100,000 a year to move to Georgia to start a church where they told me we will not be able to pay you a salary. Nothing about that made sense. How do I take care of my family? How are we going to live without an income? How does this work? It doesn't matter. It's what the Spirit said to do, and He took care of me. It was no problem. When you release yourself to begin listening to the Spirit, listen, if you know Christ, if you know He died on your behalf, if you know that He gave you His righteousness and took your condemned status, your spirit is alive and that communication process is happening. The issue is you got to start trusting it. you got to start trusting. Watch this. Why you had that dream. Ooh. 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 So we go into the book of Acts and it says in the last days, Your young men are going to have visions. And your older men are going to dream dreams. And guess what? They're significant. In the spirit, I had no control over that. He's going to press my heart in a grocery store. Help that person. Help them. I don't know. I feel kind of dumb. I'm a man. She's a woman. She might be single. I could get myself in a lot. Go help that woman. He's going to tell you, go ask your neighbor what happened to them when they were 12. And you're going to say, my neighbor will think I'm nuts. But then you're going to go over and you're going to have the guts and you're going to walk out in faith and you're going to say, I know this is going to sound crazy, but what happened to you when you were 12? And your neighbor is going to break down in tears and tell you how they were abused and how they just don't know what to do with it. And you're going to be able to share the gospel with them. Why? Because you're being led by the Spirit instead of by the soul Amen. because the soul will protect you yes. it will hold you back it will lie to you it will make you rationalize things and yet the spirit is saying trust me walk in what I have for you is this sinking with anybody? Yes. yeah <laughs> so that I can say it I don't know of a scarier thing to do than to walk completely trusting the Spirit. I don't. It's scary. But He never lets me down. It's incredible. I I've told this story before. I'm only going to tell it now because I want you to get a picture of what I'm talking about. A lady comes up here and asks me to pray for her. Listen, I asked the Spirit 
to tell me what I'm supposed to say to her. I don't want to come up with something in my head. So I'm praying with her, and this is what I see. A pizza. (laughs) And it's broken into pieces. And he says, tell her about the pizza. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm a minister. We're praying here. We're not talking about pizza. And I say to her, I see a pizza. It's broken up into pieces. And now I see the pizza being pushed back together. And it's like the cheese is going right over where the cuts are. I'm telling this lady this. The cheese is going right over where the cuts are. I see the cheese. I'm thinking she's got to be thinking I'm an idiot. She's snickering. It's not helping. And I say to her, all I can get out of that that the Spirit is telling me is that your life is kind of broken into pieces, but God's going to put it back together so there's a wholeness in you. I had no clue what that was about. But I said that prayer on a Wednesday. And on Sunday, I watched her get up in front of the inner healing group to give a testimony. And this is what she said. Last Wednesday night, I was coming home from work and I knew I wanted to go to church. And so I came to my house and I had to heat up something quick. And all I had was a frozen pizza. But when I pulled it out of the package, it was broken into pieces. So I put it on the pan, I pushed it together, and I took some cheese out of the refrigerator, and I put it all over it to kind of hold it back together. And then I came to church, and the pastor's telling me about my pizza. (laughs) Now, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Go to 1 Corinthians. Read about the gifts of the Spirit. There's a thing called a word of knowledge. I had a word of knowledge that she had dealt with a broken pizza that day. I didn't know she had dealt with a broken pizza. But the Spirit said, talk to her about this pizza and I'll show you how this word of knowledge thing works. And she walked away. Listen to me. Think about it for yourself. When you walk away after the pastor prays that over you, what are you thinking? That was weird. But it must be that God is trying to prove to me that he's going to put my life back together. It's walking in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, and it's not just about when ministers stand up here and pray and prophesy. It's about you recognizing that you were born again, not fleshly, not in your soul, Listen, if you like apple pie before you got saved, you liked apple pie after you got saved. Your mind didn't get recreated. It wasn't a new creation. What was a new creation? Your spirit. Because it was dead and it came to life. Now you're a new creature because you're walking by the spirit instead of by your soul and your natural man. So we got to walk this life out listening for the spirit to tell our soul and our body what we're doing what to do. Because I'm telling you, it's a much, 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 much more exciting life than being led by my soul. Amen. Mm. I could stay here a while. Um, ooh. Okay. So when I'm led by my soul, I used to work with church planters, guys who were starting churches up. And they would come to me and they'd say things like this. How do you know how big of a building to get? How do you know how many chairs to get? How do you know what advertising to do? How do you know how to kick off this thing and get it really rolling? And this is what I would tell them. What's your plan for your finances? Uh, Here's the average amount an adult person gives a week in a church in the United States. How many people are you planning to have? Well, I think I'll have 100. Okay, take this number, multiply it by 100. That's what your income will be each week. Now spread that that out by four weeks, and that's probably what your income is per month. So how much building can you afford? It's going to be based on what you're paying yourself, what you're paying other people, what you got to buy, all that kind of thing. And then when they're done and they said, well, okay, I need to get 2,000 square foot, I'd say, then you don't need God. You don't need God if you're just going to use your soul to come up with a plan. The question is now, what is the Spirit telling you? Is He telling you to set up for 400 or is He telling you to set up for 100? Now listen, there's crazy in this. Let me tell you when the soul takes back over. Here's when the soul takes back over in a church planner's life. I think I'm going to rent Texas Stadium for my opening day. 
That thing cost $8 million an event to rent. That's not God, that's stupid. That's your soul. What is the spirit guiding you to do? Listen, I think Paul took a risk when he stepped out of the boat and got on the water, right? He took a risk. The risk was this lifelong fisherman might fall in the water. It wasn't a big risk. Look at Moses. When Moses was told to go back into Egypt, he could be killed for what he's doing. It's a bigger risk to me. It's a bigger step of faith. But he goes in knowing, I know these people. I know who to talk to. I know where to start. There's some strategy here. I think I can get a voice with Pharaoh. We'll see if God backs me up. That's a big risk. You want to show a really big risk? Is when the king says, if you don't bow down before me, I'm going to put you in a furnace. And you don't bow down before him. That's a death sentence. And every time God came through, every time they were led by the Spirit and they did what God told them to do, and every time they had a success, you say, well, Peter didn't have a success. He fell in the water. Listen to me. When's the last time you walked two or three feet on the water? <laughs> Peter had a success. He walked on the water. Twice. All right. Stand to your feet. I'm going to testify to you. Two and a half weeks ago, the Spirit told me, teach them about their alive spirit. And I have followed that word, and I'll probably do it again next week because I don't think we're done with this subject. But I'm going to invite you to do this. Begin rereading your scriptures. Begin re-understanding what it means to be alive in Christ. I want you to go back and look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16 and understand the process of communication from God is that the Holy Spirit sits the deep things of God and brings them to your spirit because your eyes and your ears and your soul are not going to understand them. So he brings them and he plants them in your spirit and your spirit can begin to direct your soul. How? When I trust the spirit to direct my soul and I don't try to figure out everything with my mind and my process. I'm telling you, it wears me out. Let me show you how it wears you out. Over and over and over, you're thinking about that treatment for depression, for cancer. What if I take this pill? What if I don't go through with it? What if I go halfway through it? How's it going to feel? What am I going to do? How do I solve this financial problem? What if I were to take this thing and sell this and buy this and try to rearrange this? And you're doing every single bit of it, never asking the Holy Spirit. Never saying, what is it I'm supposed to do? What is it I need to do? What is the right thing to do? Because I promise you, you'll just make more messes. Trying to use your soul and your mind to figure out the path that God has for a child of His. What you're saying is, I don't need you, God. I got enough right here to figure it out. So let me just walk in what I think and know. And I can tell you I did it for years and I ended up in the same mess over and over and over. Until I began to release it and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? That sounds crazy. I'll do that. And I've watched him take care of me time and time again. Close your eyes for just a minute. You, in a conversation right now, ask Holy Spirit, can you put something on my spirit? that I can understand through my spirit. Give me a solution. Show me a change that's going to make a difference. In the name of Jesus, I release you right now from your mind and your soul. And I bless your spirit to rise up and connect with Holy Spirit and tell your soul and your body what to do. I command your spirit to tell your body to be healed. I command your spirit to tell your soul that you are righteous in God's eyes, that you are a warrior, that you are fit, that he has great plans for you, that he will never, never, never leave you or forsake you. Look in the mirror of what God is saying. What did he prophesy over you? Did he tell you of a coming ministry? Did he tell you of a road ahead that you would walk? Did he tell you of a prosperity coming? Then why are you still trying to get it in your mind and your soul? Receive it in your spirit. 
walk in what he's telling you. This is a new day for many of you. A new day to walk out a life led by the Spirit. A new day to tell Holy Spirit, I am open, Holy Spirit, to you teaching me how to walk by the alive Spirit in me. I desire to do it your way, to not give my body and my soul over to unrighteousness. Eyes closed. I want to teach you one more thing before you leave here. So when Paul says, do I continue in sin so that grace may abound? And the answer is, by no means. Why? Because you're presenting your body and your soul to unrighteousness, sin, and oppression by the evil one. To come in and make your soul depressed. To come in and make your body cancer. See, your spirit is clean. It is righteous before God. And it will fight on your behalf the whole time. But when we decide to give ourselves over to sin, we're saying, Satan, take my body and take my mind. It's now in the field of unrighteousness instead of in the world of righteousness with the Spirit. So I do not want to give my body and my mind and my soul over to sin because it leads to attack. It leads to depression. It leads to illness. It leads to being out from under the blessings of God. But when I listen to my spirit and my soul and my body obey, we are given over to righteousness. We are given over to clarity. We're giving over to cleanliness. That's where I want my soul and my body committed to righteousness so that I can walk in his ways so that he can see me as a golden vessel, not an earthen vessel. One worthy of more. One ready for more because it's led by the Spirit and not by the soul. There's no argument between God and the Spirit. There's an argument between God and my soul. So when I hand my soul over to my spirit, I'm in line with God. Praise you for that, God. So maybe right now, just in the quietness of this moment, you need to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you just need to say, this is new to me. I'm not sure how to do this, but I'm going to begin listening. Not with my eyes and my ears and my brain. With my spirit. I just bless your spirit to hear from Holy Spirit on how to do that.